5% of our force elements stationed in the United States. We will have to fight to get to the fight. This is driving us to apply command and control capabilities in new and innovative ways and integrate logistics planning with all warfighting functions, beginning right here in the homeland. A huge comparative advantage our nation has is our constellation of allies and partners. But our adversaries are coercing other nations, pushing their authoritarian model beyond their own borders, forcing others to make diplomatic, economic, and military decisions which are not favorable to a stable and open international order and can absolutely adversely affect our access and freedom of maneuver. And of course, we are inextricably linked to our commercial partners. You are the foundation of our strength during crisis and conflict, and we need you to be ready. Similar to Secretary Kendall's thought experiment on the Battle of the Atlantic, Defender Europe 2020 demonstrated a combined naval escort operation of a carrier strike group providing simulated armed naval convoy of a transcom roll-on, roll-off vessel and two charter commercial vessels transporting material across the Atlantic. This exercise highlighted the requisite agility and interoperability of the commercial and military assets operating in a future all-domain contested environment. We also need you to be thinking and planning differently. What are the vulnerabilities that can affect our logistics flows? How resilient is your network to a pervasive and persistent threat? When discussing the Afghanistan evacuation, President Biden stated, the only country in the world capable of projecting this much power on the far side of the world with this degree of precision is the United States of America. I want you to know that without your partnerships, we simply cannot project power on a global scale and thus achieve our national security in, uh, uh, interests. Now, this is an accolade, but it's also a responsibility that we share should our nation be challenged again. And that is a certainty. Together with you, this past year was nothing short of historic. You took part in significant operations and exercises, demonstrating the full power of the joint deployment and distribution enterprise. I'd like to take a couple of minutes to highlight some of the incredible work you've done for our nation.
Wow. Together we deliver for our nation. Thank you for an extraordinary year. And throughout, you've been innovating, experimenting, assessing, bringing on new capabilities to enhance the enterprise. Let me take the next few minutes to talk specifically about a portion of the Transcom portfolio. Now, the slides give you a sense of the wide range of activities and capabilities necessary for an effective JDDE. I'd love to talk about all of them, uh, but in the interest of time, I've highlighted a few areas I think are worthy of your attention. First, CRAF. Our connection to commercial carriers dates back to the 1950s. Many of our operational plans are large and designed to transport a force the size of St. Louis. We certainly cannot accomplish this Herculean effort with our organic fleet alone. Thank you for your commitment to daily commercial augmentation and the Civil Reserve Air Fleet Program. Our most recent activation was only the third time in our nation's history, and it clearly illustrated the criticality of close coordination between industry and military leaders. Rest assured, we remain strong advocates for our commercial partners and are committed to the viability and future health of the craft program. Accordingly, I believe the health of the craft program is firmly nested in future innovations focused on reliability, efficient operational practices, and cyber resilient command and control systems. Second, analytics. Our amazing Joint Distribution Process Analysis Center team, led by our very own Mr. Bruce Bussler, recently released their findings from our Mobility Capability Requirement Study 20 and the Fuel Tanker Vessel Study. One notable finding was that the Fuel Tanker Vessel Study clearly demonstrates the need for a tanker security program as a strategy to increase U.S. flag tanker capacity, reduce the risk of reliance on foreign flag tankers, and ensure the Department of Defense has sufficient tanker capabilities to meet our national security objectives. Going forward, we're working with the Department and the services to advocate for the necessary capabilities to ensure the JDDE remains capable into the future. Next, on household goods, our Defense Personal Property Program team is busy, and rightfully so. Our people are our most critical asset, and our families are the North Star providing the primary reason we seek this change. They deserve the best relocation experience possible. In the coming weeks, we expect to, avoid, uh, to award a global household good contract, which raises the standard of quality service, transparency, and accountabilities that our families deserve and that Congress has demanded. A single move manager will incentivize investment in capacity and strategic relationships with trusted suppliers to meet peak demand and deliver modern digital management tools. This will enable responsive and transparent communications with our service members and their families. This is a significant quality of life contract, which will remain one of my command's focus as we move forward. And as we move forward, I'm reminded of what Transcom does on any given day due to our AMC, STDC, and MSC teams with the assistance of our partners. Every day, they're carrying out our missions to project the joint force around the globe, and these missions lead to some incredible statistics. Now, you see some impressive numbers on the slide, but let me remind you that this level of activity occurs every single day. These numbers don't even include our participation in exercises, turbo activations, or the recent Afghanistan NEO. These exercises and operations prove our ability to surge the entire enterprise at any moment to anywhere. Now, both Defender Europe and Defender Pacific are great examples of our readiness building exercises and deterrence initiatives, which required industry's assistance to maneuver the force. Even while contending with a global pandemic, these exercises tested our ability to transport cargo and people under a simulated, contested environment. Although scaled back due to COVID, this year's Defender Europe utilized four roll-on, roll-off vessels. Additionally, our Service Deployment and Distribution Command exercised the first Joint Logistics Over the Shore, or JLOTS, exercise that was in Europe for the first time since World War II. We also demonstrated the capability to pump fuel for the first time from a fuel tanker vessel using our wet logistics over the shore or wet lots operation. 
Defender Pacific utilized four roll-on, roll-off vessels and tested Transcom's ability to pivot to another area of responsibility while addressing the many different problem sets to include access, basing, and overflight constraints. This exercise demonstrated a joint forcible entry operation while imposing multiple cognitive dilemmas throughout the Pacific. Again, a very realistic scenario this enterprise might face when, uh, when in a conflict with our pacing threat. These exercises promote interoperability, resiliency, and provide credible deterrence around the world. Once again, I am grateful and aware of your critical contributions to meet our national security objectives. Thank you. Now, while these exercises are just a snapshot of our countless efforts, they are instrumental in preparing the joint distribution uh, and deployment enterprise. And as I leave you thinking about the future logistics operations requirements, I want to take a few minutes and highlight the historic efforts of our most recent non-combatant evacuation operation. These efforts not only illustrate the resolve of the logistics enterprise, they highlight the compassion of the military and our partners around the world. Earlier this summer, under what seemed to be impossible timelines, Transcom executed the largest drawdown of its kind in Afghanistan. Fast forward to August, no one could have predicted the Afghanistan government would fall in 11 days and that we would conduct the largest humanitarian neo airlift in American history. But when our president called, we delivered. The Taliban are sweeping across Afghanistan, taking control of at least 30 of its 34 provinces over the last 10 days and their provincial capital. Today, Taliban fighters took control of the capital, Kabul. President Ashraf Ghani suddenly fled the country. Then this. Taliban fighters were seen rolling up the Afghan flag inside the presidential palace. And tonight, President Biden is deploying another 1,000 troops to Kabul. They're part of a 6,000-strong contingent to help evacuate Americans. By the next day, thousands of Afghans flocked to Kabul's international airport looking to escape. This is one of the largest, most difficult airlifts in history. And the only country in the world capable of projecting this much power on the far side of the world with this degree of precision is the United States of America. New urgency evacuation flights back on in Afghanistan, just hours after twin suicide bombings that left dozens dead, including 13 U.S. troops. These ISIS terrorists will not win. We will rescue the Americans. We will get our Afghan allies out. And our mission will go on. America will not be intimidated. And I have the utmost confidence in our brave service members who continue to execute this mission with courage and honor to save lives and get Americans, our partners, our Afghan allies out of Afghanistan. just announced that the last plane carrying Americans from Afghanistan has now left the country. This puts an end to the longest war in American history. This evacuation could simply not have been done without the amazing flexibility of the U.S. Transportation Command and the airlift provided by the United States Air Force. No other military in the world has anything like it.
no other military in the world, no other transportation enterprise in the world. You. You did that. Every time I see that video, I swell with pride to be an American and part of this awesome Transcom team. Now, I'm sure you recognize some of the photos in the video, some iconic images representing the enormous impact of this operation. When I see those images, I see humanity. I see American values on display. I see compassion. The Afghanistan NEO was really a capstone event for this enterprise. Our entire warfighting framework was put to the test. Global posture, mobility capacity, global command and control, integration. Our Air Mobility Command and commercial partners crushed it, if I do say so myself. Whether you're talking about our contingency response personnel who operated Kabul International Airport, our enablers who provided our en route support, our air medical evacuation teams flying out our wounded, our aerial refueling teams extending our reach, our global operations center and air operations center providing command and control, our C-17 crews and maintainers, or our civil reserve air fleet. This incredibly dedicated team of mobility professionals are the best in the world. This operational team was integrated at every level. Four department level agencies, Department of Defense, State, Homeland Security, and Health and Human Services. Four combatant commands, CENTCOM, UCOM, NORTHCOM, TRANSCOM. I mention all of these to highlight the scale and magnitude of the operation. Our teamwork spanned to our vast constellation of allies and partners and our extensive global posture. We had more than 30 countries providing airlift out of Kabul. Nine countries welcomed our Afghan refugees at intermediate staging bases and countless others donated support. Our State Department worked diligently with international partners and combatant commands to acquire the international support agreements necessary to enable this operation. Now, this is merely a glimpse into the integration I foresee in an all-domain contested conflict with our pacing threat. And of course, industry was instrumental to increasing our capacity, leading to the full success of this operation. Stage one of craft brought in 18 aircraft from multiple carriers. And what you might not have known is that many of those carriers volunteered their support prior to the 22nd of August when, the sec when Secretary Austin ordered the activation of Craft Stage 1. All of our commercial partners embodied the American spirit during this operation, and they're still going strong as operations have recommenced. I've even heard of commercial crews staged at Ramstein going out and buying toys, coloring books, candy, diapers, and other supplies to give to Afghan families and children. And I'm sure there's countless similar stories because this is the core of what it means to be an American. To all of those who went out of their way to extend a hand of compassion, I offer you a very special thank you. Let me close by saying how proud I am of the men and women of Transportation Command and the Greater Joint Deployment and Distribution Enterprise. Over the years, I have observed and been a part of amazing capabilities that you have enabled, and I am excited for the opportunity to interact and build upon the connections and bonds with so many leaders before me have established. Resilient and reliable, agile and adaptable must be more than a bumper sticker. The future all-domain contested environment requires our logistics enterprise to be resilient and reliable. Our warfighting framework must be agile and adaptable in order to deter our potential adversaries and, if necessary, win decisively. We have the framework, the talent, 
the relationships and the values necessary to succeed in great power conflict today. But we cannot rest when it comes to tomorrow because there is no second place when it comes to our national defense. Together, we deliver. Thank you. Okay, it is with great trepidation after my four days of experience that I stand up here saying, you got any questions? And no questions from AMC, okay? <laughs> Ma'am, do you foresee a transportation management system acquisition in the coming year? You know, we've been looking at a transportation management system now for a couple of years. Uh, and we are looking at the, the feasibility uh, and the return. Uh, on really, we, the first thing we looked at were what are the gaps and seams? Why must we look into a transportation management system? And as we're getting fidelity on that analysis right now, we're going to determine is there a return on investment uh, in doing that? And then, most importantly, probably what portions of the defense transportation system, which is sort of it's pretty large, it's outside of our or even our budget, would we even include in that? So we're scaling that right now. Uh, we're taking a close look. Uh, and I think, I think there's absolutely benefit to a TMS system. Uh, the question is, you know, what, what would we do, what parts of it, and when would we incorporate it? So we're, we're not going to jump after this, you know, uh, headstrong. We're going to take a really close look at it and make sure it, it delivers. It delivers the financial accountability. It delivers uh, the payment system. Uh, it delivers the visibility that this enterprise requires. Thanks for that question. Ma'am, you mentioned the need for self-examination. In, in the next coming years, what are your priorities and where do we start? Yeah, so we start at the beginning, right? We look at what we've been doing. Uh, we've had several assessments really over the last year uh, on our strategy and, and frankly the entire enterprise. And we've had a really good look now at where we're going with the national defense strategy and the service concepts, um, the joint concept for contested logistics and how the services will actually operate in this new strategic environment. It's exposed a few gaps and a few seams. So I think um, a, a thoughtful look at those gaps and seams, whether it be uh, uh, full of, um, uh, assessments, whether it be war games, and collecting that information and prioritizing. What can I see, you know, uh, right now? First of all, as I said, war fighting readiness is still our number one priority. Uh, we've got to ensure that we can be and deliver an immediate force tonight, an decisive force when necessary. So that's not just about equipment number readiness. It's about people readiness. It's about modernization. So we have credible capacity so we can maneuver the force out into the future. I also look at, at uh, really uh, cyber threats. Right? We, we've seen it, we, we saw it demonstrated with Colonial Pipeline here in the United States. It is a real threat to all of us, and it's a growing threat. And if you can imagine, a cyber criminal can get into a system and you know, lock up the eastern coast and cause fuel prices to rise, uh, what could a persistent threat, a persistent and very capable threat, do to our systems and slow us down? And not just in the cyber as in traditional what's on the computer, but also in information operations, right? How could they affect the will of the American people to get after our national security objectives? So those are some things that I'll be you know, focused on early on uh, as I do the full assessment uh, of, the, of the enterprise. But here's where I need you to think, right? You all have been working in this area, whether you're in the component commands or you're in industry, you're seeing the strategic environment. You're meeting it every day, right? Uh, f your freedom of maneuver has been challenged already, right? And we're not even in conflict. So I ask for your ideas, right? My, I have to squint to listen. I am listening. I'm here to get your ideas on how we can close those gaps together uh, because we have to do it together because, again, it is our responsibility, right? If, if we are going to conflict, we're going into it together. 
Right? It will be a national imperative for our economy and national security that we do this together. So we got to grow together. Uh, we got to continue to remain transparent um, with policies, right, and, and what we're trying to get after. So I, I ask for your help. Uh, and so this will be a journey. I expect in the next 90 days I'll have an opportunity to review the entire enterprise. Uh, and then we'll get together and, and work on priorities and, and have an opportunity to talk about that into the future. So I'm, I'm very excited. Look, General Lyons has let, and this team has left you know, a really good path forward. They're making some really good uh, improvements and reducing risks in, in a lot of areas. But I think the mobility capability requirements study, um, the future of deployment and distribution assessment uh, of the enterprise, that they're uncovering some things that we got to get after. And getting after it, we will. Good morning. Um, I'm Eric Johnson. I'm with the Maritime Administration. About five or six years ago, um, Transcom did a really interesting exercise that combined uh, one of the Army's C uh, emergency deployment readiness exercises, the CDRI, with uh, turbo activation. And uh, it seemed to work pretty well, but I hear there's you know, some cost issues with it. Planning goes into it and stuff like that. It takes a lot of time and coordination. Is there any uh, movement to possibly do more stuff like that again? So I'm going to phone a friend, wet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I am not familiar with that, but what is? Yes, I want more of everything. Uh. Thanks. Yes, ma'am, that's what I was going to say. Um, uh, co yeah, cost is obviously an issue uh, with giant movements and synchronization really across a joint force when you have an exercise layout globally um, uh, and, and trying to integrate these kind of big movements with that. Now recently the CDRI exercise very successful um, including dealing with a contested environment and training commercial mariners during that exercise to operate in that environment. So I think we've got a, a good path forward in that way. Um, whether or not you synchronize a CDRI with a, with a uh, uh, turbo activation, there's a value, per, you know, um, uh, potential value there, but I think we're better off as we move forward of seeing how many of these kinds of exercises we can do in a year and then build them up to a more, uh, a larger global kind of response exercise. So, um, yes, good idea. Funding challenges, I think they're there. There's huge value in it for the mariners and for the military as well. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> Man, we have a few questions on investments. Mm -hmm. um, so, in the coming years, what are your priorities in terms of investments in? the infrastructure that we need, as well as the capacity that we need in order to accomplish our mission. Yeah, thanks. As, um, as you probably know, uh, we're, we did, uh, with our looking around the world with our ports and nodes, uh, we're looking uh, at supporting Department of Transportation with the surface trans reauthorization uh, to try to bolster uh, the military infrastructure, the infrastructure, the civilian infrastructure the military uses here in the United States. Uh, and uh, we are critically looking at our ports uh, around the world. Now, I can't, uh, I can't give you the priorities one to N on, on that infrastructure, uh, but I can tell you that it's critical. I can tell you that when we look at the warfighting framework, you know, of our, 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 our posture, our capacity, and our ability to see two, in the strategic environment, you have to be able to turn all those, right? Uh, in the uh, non-combatant evacuation, we had to expand our posture. We had to move people around. We had to have par get parking spaces at IUD. Uh, we had to, we, our posture had to change, our capacity had to change, and our C2 uh, maneuvered as well. So we're, we're going to dial all those levers to ensure that, that we can provide an immediate force tonight and decisive force when necessary. The other piece of that was, is capacity. Uh, I am concerned in several areas. The, the recent uh, mobility capability requirements study did show some areas of increased risk uh, across the enterprise. 
uh, I mentioned one, which was sea lift. Uh, we have uh, too many railroads that are going to be retiring. They're pretty old, pretty costly to maintain. Uh, and our readiness numbers for the actual vessels are a lot lower than I would like. So we've got to get and recapitalize those with buy use strategy and, pro and provide some, some more money into fixing those ships. Uh, and I think that we have a good pathway forward with the Department of Navy uh, on that piece. Uh, we talked about foreign fla or, uh, US flag for tanker. A tanker missile study showed that we, we do need a tanker security program. Uh, and so I'm, I'm fully uh, supportive of that. And Merritt's taking a look at that right now. I will define some requirements for that uh, US flagged uh, capability. And then on the air mobility side, I am concerned about air refueling and airlift. Uh, we, did, uh, uh, we did look at the, the air refueling portion, and I'm, I'm excited that Air Mobility Command just uh, provided an additional capability release for the KC-46. So about 60% of our receiver force now can, can go up against the KC-46, so we can use that a little more effectively, which is very helpful. Uh, and then on the airlift side, uh, as, as great as the C-17 was uh, in, uh, uh, in OAR, we still need to make sure that that airplane is fully capable out into the future and can handle a contested environment as well as uh, the other airlift platforms. So we'll be really closely watching the services who are responsible to provide uh, that, that capacity and capability to Transcom so that we can fight it. Uh, so I'll be supportive of, of their budgets uh, and engaging uh, with them and, the, and my fellow combatant commanders on the way forward for capabilities. So it is, a, you know, it is, this is about measured risk, right? We have limited resources, and we've got to get the best capability we can for the nation, uh, not just in transportation, but also uh, in the core concepts uh, that the services bring. Uh, so we'll be evaluating that very closely as we, as we roll out. And as you know, the PB22, the 22 budget, uh, under a CR, we're st it's still in play for final, final budget authority. I've heard some good news about that, but I'm, I'm going to wait to see uh, where the appropriators land on, on that kind of resourcing. So that's a good question. Ma'am, another question similar to that. We've talked about the hardware in a post-COVID world or in a, in a COVID world we're, we're living in. Are you concerned about the soft side? And that's the people and the labor, the uh, force that, that we need in the future. Yeah, absolutely. I am concerned uh, about uh, both on the military and, and the industry, right? Uh, the, the people that, first of all, you know, our seed corn that we're developing up to, to be in the trucking industry or in the sea lift industry or in the military as, as pilots or in the commercial world as pilots, uh, I am concerned about their development and the culture, right? Uh, as we think about the move to strategic competition, how are we developing uh, those that are going to be operating the transportation system? Uh, this is not going to be, it's not going to be, it's going to be more dynamic than it ever has been, right? So how do we, how do we help them think about that, all right? How do we help our, our C2 systems be able to dynamically maneuver sea um, lift and airlift out into the future? And then how do we take care, right? Take care of our people is one of the focus areas, all right, all of us, right? And how do we, how do we ensure that they're resilient, right? Uh, coming out of COVID, uh, there's, uh, you know, concerns about uh, taking the vaccine, but, you know, I can tell you when we think about where we're going, force health protection is a key, key priority. We want to make sure that uh, our mariners are safe, our truckers are safe, our, our pilots are safe and effective. I mean, if a pilot comes to work and they have COVID and they, and they spread, we could take out a full crew or, or take out close contacts for a short period of time, that degrades readiness writ large. So how do we deliberately go about uh, taking care of the, of the people? Uh, so it, it is a balance. Like I said, it's not just equipment. It's actually the people that make it work. We can have all the kinds of great equipment, new ships, and the greatest command and control system, but we've got to have the right people to, to make that work. And the right people that want to come to these industries in, into the future. So we want to make sure we don't do any major changes um, that uh, are not well thought of so that you know, people want to be truck drivers into the future and they want to come into the military and serve their nation. And when I think about you know, the commercial industry and how small the Department of Defense 
percentage-wise is of what we do, you know, that's fragile, right? I want all of our industry partners to know that they are a part of national security, right down to the truck driver, right down to the stevedore. And I want them to be proud of what they've done. That's why I'm so proud of these videos, right? We cannot do what we do without our, our industry partners. So we have to make sure that they understand that and you know, getting the messaging to them and thanking them, frankly, uh, including those folks who d deliver your household goods uh, when they come to your door, right? Yeah, they're all part of this national security apparatus. Couldn't do it without them. So thanks. Great question. Ladies and gentlemen, we have time for one, one more question. Or not. Yeah. Ma'am, one last question is, how do we improve the communication across all parts of this enterprise? That's a PhD level question. Uh, comes in three parts, right? Uh, so here's what I have learned uh, at, at, at Transcom. That we have been reaching out, I think, to industry and being as transparent as possible. Really, COVID brought us closer together, I think, uh, and got us into a battle rhythm where we can better understand uh, the pain points across all our components and across industry and work better together. I have always been a huge collaborative kind of person uh, and a start with why kind of person. Uh, and ensuring that everyone understands the why of the pain points, commander's intent, and then getting after it together, it's always the best solution. It's always the best solution. So continuing that transparency, continuing those discussions, having open, clear discussions about what the problems are, what our intent is, and are there any, any other way to get to that intent, um, providing that opportunity, I think, is, is really very important. And it's at every level. It's not at the CEO level all the time. It really needs to be at the working level. People ought to be comfortable picking up the phone and talking to each other about a pain point or about a potential thing that could come our way and how we can forecast it and minimize it, right, so that we can maintain a healthy industry and healthy, healthy readiness capability across the JDDE. So I am all about uh, transparency. I will continue uh, to have those discussions here within the staff uh, and across industry because I absolutely think it was the winning combination. And look no further than the NEO when we stepped up to the precipice and activated Kraft for the third time. There was some discussions about Kraft phase two. There were really real discussions about how that would affect our economy. You know, what do we really need? How are the requirements being defined? And we got to Kraft stage one. And, and there was, so there was foreshadowing and then there was execution. But it, it took an understanding of what from industry, what that was going to cause, what issues that was going to cause, and the benefits to national security. So I think that we weighed that pretty good. Uh, and it's all because people came to the table and they were just up front with us about the, the issues that would cause or, and the benefit that, that that would bring. So once again, I would say thanks to everyone for your great work during that and every time. And I, and I hope that if this, uh, you know, as we go, if we have to go into conflict, that we're in that same position where you know who to call. Uh, and, uh, and that will be critical. So thanks, and I think we're going to do a quick award. Formally established by the Transcom Commander in February of 2021, the Pegasus Award is the highest civilian honor bestowed by the U.S. Transportation Command. This award recognizes private citizens or organizations who have significantly assisted or supported U.S. Transcom functions, services, or operations, and who have proven to be strong advocates of the command. Recognizing these individuals or groups demonstrates the interest of DOD management in improving efficiency and effectiveness, and encourages citizens and organizations in their efforts to assist in accomplishing DOD missions. In Greek mythology, Pegasus represents science, intellect, and understanding. This award reflects how these attributes underpin the keys to conducting globally integrated mobility operations, the dynamic synchronization of our global mobility posture, global mobility past capacity, and global command control and integration. On behalf of the men and women of U.S. Transportation Command, 
It is my distinct honor to announce that Mr. Bill Flynn is being presented the Pegasus Award today. Mr. Flynn, sir, will you please come forward? <laughs> Mr. Flynn is receiving the Pegasus Award for his support to Transcom and the Mobility Enterprise as the former National Defense Transportation Association Chairman from 2014 to 2017 and for his contributions as a member of the Defense Science Board Task Force on Survivable Logistics from May of 17 to July of 18. During his time as the Chairman of NDTA and as a member of the Defense Science Board Task Force, Mr. Flynn was integral to the efforts to review the threats to U.S. military logistics posed by strategic competitors. His recommendations and the resultant analysis highlighted to the SECDEF exploitable seams and gaps existing within the JDDE and the Joint Logistics Enterprise, providing recommendations to modernize the le and leverage air, ground, and sea modes of transportation and lines of communication, building resiliency in military and commercial information networks. Mr. Flynn is only the fourth person to receive this prestigious award, highlighting his contributions to the command and its mission to project and sustain mobility forces globally to advance U.S. Secu security interests and assure our allies and partners, and if necessary, to win decisively. Congratulations, sir. Congratulations, Mr. Flynn. It's uh, well deserved, and I just would uh, offer NDTA's uh, immeasurable pride in what you've accomplished. Uh, Bill is also now the uh, the leader, CEO, president of uh, Amtrak, and told me this morning that they're about back to 70 percent of what normal operations would be. So that's that's really good to hear the progress that's happening there. Right now, and, and, and again, thank you, General Van Ovost, looking uh, where she went, but I want to say thank you for your leadership and thank you for your remarks today and, and your vision for the future and your openness to listening and to uh, engaging with industry to continue the dialogue that has been established uh, over the, the COVID period of time. I couldn't be prouder of Transcom having served there and just to see the progress and the openness that, that we all work together very efficiently, very openly, and as the general said, transparently. So I'm uh, very proud of Transcom in that regard. Right now, we're going to take a break until 1030. We're going to have a really good panel at 1030, led by Major General Deb Katulich, and it's going to be talking about the COVID crisis itself. And so we're looking forward to that. So please be back at 1030. Thank you. <laughs>